Thanks so much, Raj. And you've changed my life, too. And everyone's life here by writing firms of endearment. And <laughs> so we've had, we, had, we had the first lady of uh, marketing to women earlier. And now we have the godfather of conscious capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever go against the family. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'm also uh, extra thrilled uh, to, uh, people ask me about my background. They say, where, you know, where did you do your academic work? I say, MSU. They say, oh, Michigan State. I say, no, make stuff up. <laughs> so I was glad to have the opportunity to make something up for the event that we're all enjoying together. The theme is integrating the masculine and feminine. Richard Tarnas said it really well in The Passion of the Western Mind. The Western psyche is on the verge of an unprecedented epochal transformation, a triumphant and healing reconciliation between the two great polarities, a union of opposites, a sacred marriage between the long dominant but now alienated masculine and the long suppressed, but now ascending feminine. And Richard wrote that about 20 years ago. So at that point, we were on the verge, and I think now we're in the middle of it. And part of the question for us all is, how do we create that sacred marriage individually? Because as Jeffrey just suggested, if we don't do the individual inner work, we can't do the work in the world in our organizations. I'm going to offer some slightly different perspectives than we may have heard. I'm going to talk a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci's role as a prophet of this epochal transformation. I'm also going to talk about the historical figure who I think did more than anyone in history to transform our perception of the capabilities of women. She's... Well, I'll let, I'll let, she'll be a surprise. See if you can guess who it is. <laughs> and we'll also hear from authorities like Dave Barry and Bruce Willis. <laughs> 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 but it all begins in, in ancient wisdom. We did a little pranayama together earlier. Talked about the integration of the masculine and feminine energies. This is the essence of the yogic tradition. It also just happens to be the essence of Taoist wisdom. Lao Tzu noted, when male and female combine, all things achieve harmony. Anybody know what this is? Anybody recognize this image? Wild guess, who's the artist? Leonardo da Vinci, what's unusual about it? Well, that was his writing was reversed. This is, it's not so much uh, a, an uh, unusual way of representing it. It's what is being represented. Because for a thousand years in the Middle Ages in Europe, no one painted nature as the center of a painting. You got holy figures, usually kind of floating halfway up in the air with golden halos and beautiful lapis lazuli skies. You know, so always looking up to heaven and their feet are off the ground. In the Renaissance, you get people with their feet on the ground in three dimensions. So it's a huge change of perspective. But Leonardo takes it much further. There's no people in it. It's Mother Earth. Fourteen fifty-two. Five hundred years before me. <laughs> <laughs> His most famous painting. What is she smiling about? What is she smiling about? Well, let's find out. Everybody, please assume the Mona position. Please assume the Mona position. And I want you to imitate her famous smile. Imitate her famous smile. Now look around and see who here has 
a great Mona smile without cracking up. Try to look at your... Uh, this is a, I would expect nothing less than a brilliant room of fabulous Mona smiles. Doug, you've got it going on except for the beard and the mustache. <laughs> sort of the Marcel Duchamp version. How does it make you feel when you smile like Mona Lisa? Peaceful. You know, it's funny you say that because I asked a group of 80 gifted children ages 8 to 11, what is she smiling about? And they imitated her smile before I even asked them to do it. And one of the kids said, she's got a secret. And then another kid said, yeah, she knows that everything has the opposite. <laughs> and then the kids, the kids started shouting out opposites like, like, Day and night, light and dark, good and bad, boys and girls, life and death. I asked my average corporate group, what is she smiling about? A while ago, somebody said, uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the famous <laughs> smile was caused by a dental problem. <laughs> and See, the Mona Lisa is the Western equivalent of the yin and yang symbol. And what is the wisdom of yin and yang? Balance of the opposites, the harmony of the opposites. It's the very principle that sustains and nourishes our existence. You breathe in and you breathe out. Your heart expands and contracts. All your cells expand and contract. And what we call health is the rhythmic pulsation of our whole being. seen the computer-generated juxtaposition of Leonardo's self-portrait in the Mona Lisa by Professor Lillian Schwartz. She found that the proportions were exactly identical. So people say, well, was this uh, a self-portrait all along? Well, artists are always doing self-portraits in everything they touch, right? <laughs> But Leonardo is Leonardo's offering us something. He's suggesting to us something throughout his work. He's suggesting that the integration of the masculine and feminine is the secret of enlightenment. This is the real Da Vinci Code, by the way. So maybe you've seen his uh, first ever work that we know of. This is uh, actually, it's actually a painting by his teacher, Verrocchio, did, it's the baptism of Christ. Verrocchio did the central figures. And it was not unusual in those days for a master like Verrocchio to say to a promising apprentice like Leonardo, hey, uh, do the angel in the corner for me, will you? Touch up the background. So Leonardo did this angel, one of his many androgynous figures, and according to Giorgio Vasari, the first art historian in the West, when Verrocchio came back and saw what Leonardo had done, he would never touch colors again. Now, the romantic interpretation of this is he was so moved, he just couldn't paint. But the more realistic business interpretation is he said, aha, I can now delegate the painting department to the young Leonardo, I can concentrate on the more profitable practice of sculpture. So when they, this is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Part of your follow-up field trip assignment from our time together is to go visit this and see. You'll see, you'll see when you go there, you'll see what Verrocchio and Vasari saw. Because Leonardo's angel, well, all I can tell you is they, they x-rayed this painting, of course, to study it. Verrocchio's brush strokes show up very heavy. He used lead in his paint, and he very heavy with the brush. Leonardo uses no lead, and his brush strokes are so fine that when they x-ray Leonardo's angel, there's nothing there. It's like he created an angel. It doesn't just jump out from the painting. It jumps out from the whole treasure house of the Uffizi, and I want you to look at it right now very carefully. Contemplate these two angels, because this is part of the core message, as I interpret it, of the consciousness in conscious capitalism. Because 
this angel, Verrocchio's angel, is unconscious capitalism. Verrocchio's angel looks to me like a bored choir boy. It's like, okay, baptism of Christ, whatever. <laughs> you know, I just got to fill out the forms. I got to do the accounting report. Just go through the motions. And Leonardo's angel looks like, hey, this is really a miracle, which is actually the subject of the painting. And it was Einstein who said, there are two ways to live our lives. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. So last night, I wrote down her exact words. Marianne said, the embryo has the blueprint of the baby. Who did the first ever accurate drawing of the embryo in the womb? Leonardo da Vinci, who said, the seed of the mother has the power in the embryo equally with that of the father, 500 years ago. So we all know this painting. Is that an M that stands for Mary Magdalene? <laughs> well, if you believe that, let me inform you that the M stands for millions of copies sold. <laughs> See, Leonardo was not a member of the Priory of Sion, nor was he its Grand Master. And how do we know this? Well, it's obvious upon immediate reflection if you read Leonardo's notebooks, in which he rails against superstition, rituals, all the sort of nonsense described in the book. He's trying to invent science. However, when a book sells 40 million copies and gets made into a movie, and it becomes a phenomenon, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's like the, the death of Diana and the royal wedding. Uh, these are archetypal. These are things that are touching the collective unconscious of humanity. And Dan Brown intuited that this story of da Vinci and this alleged code would touch this. This is the real genius art in that, in that book. It's, it's a book that's about the long dominant uh, but now declining masculine principle and the ascending feminine principle. That's what it captured. That's what it touched. And as Dan Brown actually writes in the book, da Vinci was in tune with the balance between male and female. He believed that a human soul could not be enlightened unless it had both male and female elements. Jung called work on the shadow, knowing the dark side, looking within ourselves, doing what, I love uh, Marianne's term, she called it, an I have a new thing, it's the FMI, because I know a lot of you work in HACs, do you work in an HAC? High acronym culture. <laughs> My clients are all HACs, high acronym cultures, so I like to give them acronyms. You need to do an FMI. You gotta do an FMI, fearless moral inventory. Right? You gotta do that FMI. That's the shadow work. Jung called the shadow work the apprentice piece in individuation, in wholeness. He called the integration of the masculine and feminine the masterpiece. Any guesses on who's the figure who chained our, our consciousness? See, Leonardo did all this. Uh, I don't think many people have brought out this aspect of Leonardo's work that I'm sharing with you now. I don't think he had a direct influence in this regard. I think he had an indirect influence in capturing the humi human imagination and representing for us at various times of history all of our human potential. He's an archetype of everything that we can be. Art, science, music, poetry, beauty. But the figure I'm thinking of, the historical figure I'm thinking of, came a little bit after Leonardo. And in a much more direct way, changed the world's notion of the capability of women. Well, I commissioned a watercolor portrait of her, Elizabeth I, who said, 
though the sex to which I belong is considered weak, you will nevertheless find me a rock that bends to no wind. You know, I figure you got to have something going on if uh, both your older siblings die on the, on the throne. Your mother's murdered. You're imprisoned in the tower. You finally get out. You become queen. Philip II, the most powerful man in the world, sends his armada against you. You defeat him. Francois I is sending assassination squads left and right. You manage to have enough intelligence to avoid these attempts on your life. You make a huge leap in uniting the warring constituencies in your land. You create what's called the Golden Age. You reign for 45 years. You take the bank balance from major deficit to huge abundance. You colonize the New World. The state of Virginia is named after her. So is West Virginia. <laughs> and Elizabeth, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard, it's hard to find in Western literature uh, prior to Elizabeth's time descriptions of women as multidimensional and intelligent. They're either goddesses or seductresses. And right from the time of her most illustrious subject, Shakespeare, begins to portray women in a much more complex, multidimensional, intelligent, soulful, fascinating way. In Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, love this line, unsex me here. All right? She's ready to kick some A. <laughs> she says, I want to be liberated from the traditional notion that you may have of me and what I'm capable of. So I had this notion, I kind of intuited this, and I have a friend who's a professor of Elizabethan studies at Canterbury University in England, and another friend who's a, a professor of women's studies at Georgetown, and I said, can you help me back up this thesis? I have some little ideas, but I need some scholarship behind this. I'm not going to take you through the, all the chapter and verse that we did, but uh, just a few of the highlights of what starts to happen. After Elizabeth, there's Shakespeare, and then there's Mary Astle, who says, if God had not intended that women should use their reason, he would not have given them any, for he does nothing in vain. That's 1666 to 1731. Jane Austen. Give a girl an education and introduce her properly into the world and tend to one, but she will have the means of settling well without further expense to anybody. And I have to tell you, one of my most fun moments as an author, this is all from uh, Discover Your Genius, where I profile these geniuses throughout history, and I got to write a little bit about this thesis and about Jane Austen, and I got to put in the following line, which my editors didn't catch. <laughs> Austen's powers. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, you complete me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this one's really great. People say, how come there aren't more, more women uh, in your book on history's greatest geniuses? Well, Thank you to Virginia Woolf for answering it, because for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. Not anymore. I love Rebecca West. Check out that hat on the cover of Time magazine. I myself have never been able to find out precisely what feminine feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat or a prostitute. <laughs> you rock, Rebecca. And... I'll never forget Bella Abzai. You know, there's something about the hats and these great women. <laughs> We're coming down from our pedestal and up from the laundry room. 
So I think there's a, there's a direct line from Elizabeth, Shakespeare, and, and there's just a sampling of some of the thought leaders. But for guys, <laughs> for guys, you know, think about the last, the last 30, 40 years. You know, the last 30, 40 years, I mean, we grew up, you know, we grew up with a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Actually, it was great because in, in my, our household, my wife is the queen of the power drill. I mean, and she has a dust buster, too. Sometimes she has them both working. <laughs> she fixes everything. Uh, she's also an incredibly exquisite, gorgeous opera singer. Uh, but she's very comfortable doing a lot of these handy type things. But she ran into me the, uh, into, uh, the, uh, where I was the other day in the house. She said, sweetheart, honey, there's something I need you to do. It's, it's a man's job. There's a dead mouse <laughs> in the garage. And I just said, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> so here's the problem, though. Uh, guys, like we grew up with this, and now what we've got is this. <laughs> oh, God. We need help, people. Right? And women, women, it's even more complex because you had this and this at the same time. Remember June Cleaver? And then you got a big dose of this. <laughs> and here's the state of the art. It's Tina Fey. It's a cover of her new book. Look carefully. Look carefully at the image. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> okay, so a few uh, uh, reflections on how we're integrating all this uh, rapid change and this epochal transformation. Right, Dave Barry points out you know, in the difference between men and women, you know, if a woman has to choose between catching a fly ball and saving an infant's life, she will choose to save the infant's life without even considering if there are men on base. I love this one. Uh, oh, this is great too. Uh, so last night, I stayed up till after midnight talking to Marianne. <laughs> and, and, and I said something really strong and, and forceful about in, in defense of women. And she said, but you know, if I speak like that, uh, uh, I'm perceived as strident. And I said to her, well, you know, when a, when a man talks dirty to a woman, it's sexual harassment. When a woman talks dirty to a man, it's... I've been informed actually that the price has gone up. <laughs> <laughs> I love Camille Paglia. Leaving sex to the feminists is like letting your dog vacation at the taxidermist. <laughs> Bruce Willis. On the one hand, we'll never experience childbirth. On the other hand, we can open all our own jars. <laughs> but I tell you, my wife has one of those magic jar openers. She, right. If they ever come up with a magic mouse remover, I could be in trouble. I love Seinfeld. Men want the same thing from the underwear that they want from women. A little bit of support, a little bit of freedom. <laughs> Elaine Boozler, remember her? She's great. I'm just a person trapped inside a woman's body. And Gloria Steinem, some of us are becoming the men we wanted to marry. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave Barry really ties it all together here. The obvious and fair solution to the housework problem is to let men do the housework for, say, the next 6,000 years to even things up. The trouble is that men over the years have developed an inflated notion of the importance of everything they do so that before long they would turn housework into just as much of a charade as business is now. <laughs> they would hire secretaries and buy computers and fly off to housework conferences in Bermuda, but they'd never actually clean anything. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> so, Germaine Greer, who, by the way, has a PhD in Elizabethan studies, said, I didn't fight to get women out from behind vacuum cleaners to get them onto the board of Hoover. And I checked, and actually, there are no women on the board of Hoover <laughs> <laughs> yet. But we have lots of women who are on boards in this room, and the world has changed dramatically. Gloria said, I've yet to hear a man ask for advice on how to combine marriage and a career, but you know what? 
that was 20, 30 years ago, and that is exactly what's being asked right now. That is exactly what's being asked right now. So, Professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor wrote this fabulous book back in the 90s. Uh, but way back then, she summed up some of the very practical challenges that we all face working in organizations that are conflicts of yin and yang in terms of the mixed message as we try to go from this patriarchal modality to this more balanced modality. Here are some of the challenges we face, the kind of mixed messages we get. Think strategically and invest in the future, but keep the numbers up. Right? Be a long-term thinker, but be a short-term thinker. Be entrepreneurial and take risks, but don't cost the business anything by failing. Continue to do everything you're currently doing even better and spend more time communicating with employees, serving on teams, and launching new projects. <laughs> know every detail of your business, but delegate more responsibility to others. Become passionately dedicated to visions and fanatically committed to carrying them out, but be flexible, responsive, and able to change direction quickly. Speak up, be a leader, set the direction, but be participative, listen well, cooperate. So have all the traditional male virtues and all the new ascending female virtues. Do it all right now, please, all at once. Throw yourself wholeheartedly into the entrepreneurial game and the long hours it takes and stay fit. Succeed, 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 and raise terrific children. Whew. So we go back to Lao Tzu. The Tao is called the Great Mother, empty yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. It is always present within you. You can use it any way you want. How am I doing on time? Cultivate patience, receptivity, and empathic listening. Be bold and assertive when appropriate. Learn to move freely from patience and receptivity to bold action and vice versa. Balance imagination and logic, intuition and analysis. Use your whole brain. Cultivate, as Cindy Wigglesworth teaches us, the ability to behave with compassion and wisdom while maintaining inner and outer peace regardless of the circumstances. Transform stress with the love response. Be aware, this is maybe the most single most important thing, be aware of your anxiety and feel your feelings. And embrace a daily practice to facilitate the integration of masculine and feminine energies. Do pranayama, do tai chi, do something every single day to help change your nervous system, to be more aligned, more attuned to this new integration. So this is Leonardo's uh, St. John. It's in the Louvre. Is it more masculine or feminine? Is it more about the light or the dark? Is it more sensual or spiritual? It's that both and, isn't it? Both and, both and. And you notice I love that... Uh, Leonardo St. John has one hand on the heart, emotional intelligence, the other hand pointing up to heaven, spiritual intelligence. Last word to Jane Austen. There's no charm equal to tenderness of heart. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.